everyone how's it going today is sunday may 28th and i was standing here looking at my flowers earlier thinking wow there's a lot in bloom i have a csa um delivery route on friday coming up so that's seven bouquets that i have to make and a couple of a la cartes but there's a lot of flowers what am i going to do with all these and lo and behold literally two minutes later i get a text from the market manager that i sold at last year and that i also unexpectedly filled in to sell flowers at for mother's day she texted me and asked you want to bring flowers next week to sell because it's going to be strawberry festival and strawberry festival is always very popular so of course i said yes and i looked at my flowers and i said i might not have enough so i'm going to start harvesting today i'm actually also supplying um, a local grower with um, some sweet william for filler for um, a custom order that she's taking on so i wanted to get harvesting right now put stuff into the fridge um, i am also going to buy some Blue Plurum as well as Orlea from another local grower for that market on Sunday. So let's get harvesting. I just harvested another bucket of Sweet William. I've been harvesting so much Sweet William. That's just from that one bed back there. There's more to harvest. And then there's more in the bed back there. So Sweet William is that uh, spring biannual that you didn't know you needed until you start planting it. And it really is a workhorse and it fills that gap between tulips and everything else that's gonna come. So everything else is starting to come i'm starting to see some yarrow i'm starting to see campanula as well as snapdragons and some other stuff um, i have actually foxglove that is on its way out so i'm gonna have a lot hopefully for the market for my csa and my friend is also going to have a lot of filler for her custom arrangement so i'm gonna continue harvesting and this video will pick up probably tomorrow as i harvest even more happy memorial day everyone it is 8 a.m the weather is already warming up so it's been crazy to me how quickly in the evenings it cools down to around 50 degrees and then 40 degrees but then in the morning once the sun starts rising the temperatures are literally climbing five to seven degrees per hour so i wanted to get out here and harvest some of the um campanula or campanula i don't even know how you say it but these are the bells and i love them so these are like a deep blue violet type of bell color and i think they're gonna pair really really well with some of the other stuff i have what i love about these canterbury bells is the fact that one stem has so many flowers you can literally just put one stem with all of these open bells with some filler and it basically looks full so i'm going to be cutting these and storing these in my refrigerator so that i have them for my csa on friday as well as on sunday now typically when you're cutting these you actually want to cut when a few more of these bells are open so for something like this i am going to let it sit here for probably another day cut it tomorrow but there are some where there are more bells open you typically want to harvest when about like a quarter of them are open especially if you want to hold it i find that these actually take a while to bloom even when they are a bit colored up outside so i'm curious to see what the weather in the next couple of days as we're going to hit the 80s are going to do to these they're probably going to you know obviously blow open at a much higher faster rate but they don't blow open as fast as certain other flowers so I thought I was going to have these at least a week ago um, and the ones I thought I was going to have at least a week ago this is what they look like right now so yeah I'm just excited to finally be able to use these in some arrangements and I'm going to start harvesting some of these now as well as some of my snaps. So one thing about my snaps is I overwinter these from last year they were covered more or less with Agarbon 19 
Um, one thing that I've noticed though, is that even though I got early blooms, they don't look as full as some of my other snaps that I typically start from seed. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So I wanna preface by saying that now that I am growing to sell both for florists and retail, I look at flowers very differently for both types of customers. Now, something like this is totally fine for retail to put into like a farmer's market bouquet, even a CSA bouquet. But for a florist, they want to see more full heads. And this is the main difference that I'm seeing with my overwintered snaps is that the heads have less flowers than they would normally. So, you know, typically you would see something like this um, with a higher height and just have all of these big, luscious, open blooms. So I'm seeing smaller heads of blooms, which is totally fine. Now, the other thing is every single time I harvest a Snapdragon, I hold my breath because I'm always lifting the petals to see if there are thrips. And luckily so far, I don't have thrips yet. I feel like it's a matter of time. Last year, I lost a bed that was twice as long as this all to thrips and it was just something that i did not want to sell to my customers i mean who wants to have little brown things crawling all over their flower petals right now snaps are one of my favorite flowers so they are a flower i actually have multiple successions of one thing that i experimented this year was leaving some of the snaps i had put in in late spring they they were the ones that were overtaking my thrips and then i kept them for the fall they gave me a flush before frost and i kept those in and i wanted to see how they would do and they did not disappoint so if you look at all the ones that have the white with the pink over here these are the potomac apple blossoms these are the ones that i'm talking about i actually bought these as plugs from farmer bailey's last year and they they did well they just had thrips so i didn't sell those and then i got somewhat of a good flush in the fall but the frost kind of um you know damaged the petals a bit so i couldn't sell all of them and then i kept some of them in and they're coming back so it goes to show you that if you live in a zone where you could potentially overwinter snaps they have it within themselves to give you a few flushes before you need to put in new ones from seed. And that's one of the things I'm trying to figure out is if I really amend the soil, give it good compost after this season or this springtime, will I get another flush for the fall? And I'm hoping that the answer is yes, because then that means that I can keep this bed just, um, you know, it won't be productive, but it will still be growing and, like there'll be green foliage that they will slow down in the heat of the summer but once it gets cooler in the fall they will pick right back up and I'm lucky in the sense that I have enough space to be able to try that so I've got a bed of snaps in here and then I've got snaps down there where there's netting but it's a little bit hard to see guys look at this stem so many flowers so I've noticed that the areas where I covered, which is up to here, I have really nice long stems with lots of bells. But where I didn't cover because the cover didn't reach out here, I have a bit shorter stems and the shorter stems are harder to work with. Like this is a good example. Um, the bottom of this got cut, which is why it's withering away. But look how short this is. Um, even look at this one. like. You know, it's really hard to work with something like this because even if I cut at the base, maybe I could put into a mason jar, but it's it's hard to work with. So these are at least easier to put in a bouquet, but I love something like this because I put it with some bupleurum, maybe some orlea, and it's gonna look so good. Just finished harvesting my little bucket here. I have quite a bit in the fridge, but there are some more exciting things I want to show you. Maybe not so exciting for other people, but very exciting for me. As I was looking at the progress of my yarrow over here, I noticed that I had some fungi growing. And not only are these fungi, I'm nearly sure these are shiitake mushrooms. So I'm getting a couple of shroom friends to confirm before I eat one of these. Um, but yeah, super, super exciting. And I'm not just seeing the presence of this over here that makes me happy. I'm also seeing some other stuff. 
So for example, this slimy yellow blob is called dog, dog vomit slime. Um, my dog doesn't really vomit like this. I don't really know why it's called that, but regardless, it is a really excellent decomposer. It typically is found on mulches. Uh, it does spread through the form of spores, but it decomposes stuff really well. So I always think of it as a really, really good sign. So I have patches of this everywhere. In fact, I have some Lysianthus that is actually growing on that mold. Now, the other thing I wanna show you is this is feverfew. The amount of ladybugs I found on this feverfew is astounding. And I'm trying to look for some right now, but of course, as I'm looking for ladybugs, I can't really find any. I, oh, there's one right over there, actually. Where is it? Yep, it's crawling up and down. I don't know if you can see it on that stalk. I saw ladybug larva in here. There's a lot of hoverflies, which means that they're eating the aphids. And so a lot of people might look at something like this over here and get grossed out and try to eradicate it. But remember, in order for there to be beneficial predators like a ladybug, they need to have a food source. They need to have something to eat. So there are aphids and other stuff that are on here. I mean, there's a couple of fever few that are just completely going to be unusable, but they will be great snacks for the predators. And typically the cycle is such that you have the pests. It takes a little bit of time before the predators come. They feed on them. They are able to reproduce. And then the natural cycle starts over again. So here's another ladybug. But I am just astounded at how many ladybugs are here and I take that as a sign that I am doing something right. So I want to encourage you when you look at pests, this is assuming that you know you can you have somewhat of plentiful crop. Obviously I have a lot of fever few here and this is not just the only fever few I have. I can afford to give up you know a few plants of fever few but don't look at a pest and say hey how do i get rid of it look at a pest as a positive assuming it's not an infestation right but look at it as a positive um especially if you're growing outside and as a means for the ability for you to bring in beneficial predators like this ladybug over here there she is she's just chilling out one thing i do want to talk about is just pests as a whole. Oftentimes we look at pests and the first thing we think about is how do we eradicate them? And rather than thinking that, I would encourage you to think about why do pests exist in nature in the first place? They're a part of the food chain. Without pests, the beneficial insects that we look for would not exist. So rather than spraying, even if it's things that are organic like neem oil, neem is actually banned in some parts of the world for a reason. Even if you're spraying it at night, the very act of trying to eliminate a pest means that you're also creating an inhospitable environment for beneficial insects. They're all insects at the end of the day. So think about ways that you can use nature to help you, especially if you're growing outside. If you're growing in a structure, it's a bit of a different story, but if you're growing outside, what are ways that you can do in terms of diversifying your planting soil health to encourage those beneficial insects to show up and give it a little bit of time for them to solve your pest issue versus going directly towards some sort of spray to eradicate them. So it's now two days later and guess what? The baby ladybugs are here. Here's a ladybug larva. It looks nothing like a ladybug, but I promise you, this is an, a baby ladybug and they are notorious for feeding on aphids in their larva stage. So it's great to see that we have larva popping up all over these random stems that have a food source. So they're actually not random. But here's another ladybug that's also just chilling. So yeah, I'm starting to see the larva pop up and that is just really encouraging to me. Here's another one over here. So super, super pleased. So while we're at it, I think there's actually two ladybugs mating over here. And then here is another mini ladybug. And here are ladybug eggs. So we've got the entire life cycle on this patch of fever few. Super, super cool.
Hey everyone, it's later in the afternoon and I am going to start making bouquets for my Friday CSA customers. Let me show you what I got and the recipe idea that I have in mind. So I thought what would look really, really nice is pairing these blue purplish Canterbury bells with some white Orlea as well as some blue pleurum. So I have some blue pleurum in the back, but not enough. So I actually got this from my local grower friend, Jess, and her Orlea is amazing. This is overwintered as well as her blue pleurum. So I think that color combination would be really, really cool. And I might sprinkle in some foxgloves and some snaps in between. So I'm gonna get cranking on these bouquets. So I came out to harvest a few more of the Canterbury Bells and I wanted to show you just how slowly, in my view at least, they open up. Now today was a relatively warm day. It hit 80. Yesterday it was like high 70s. So look at where they are now versus two days ago when I made this video. As you can see, there's a little bit more coloring. I just would have expected more of the buds to have opened, but in my situation, it's actually perfect because I need to hold these until Friday, so two days from now, and then I have a market on Sunday. So by Sunday, more of these will have definitely open, and I'm going to be harvesting a lot more right now. So for example, this one is definitely ready to be harvested, as well as this one. I like to harvest this one at this stage because this is open over here. This is open over here. You can see all of these are coloring up very nicely, so they will definitely open within the next few days. And I have quite a few tall stems to play with, which is good. Here's what the final bouquets look like. This one is just Blue Plurum, Orlea, and the bells. This one has a little bit of a foxglove. And then I still have a bunch of stems left for the market. So I made some other bouquets over here and yeah, ready to go with these CSA stems on Friday. One other thing I'm treating my CSA customers this week are these little posy bunches that I'm calling them. So the ranunculus here are too short to put into normal bouquets, but too fluffy and too good to not use. So here's a little bonus bouquet. And honestly, I just have so much Sweet William that I'm happy to use them in this context. So these are great for the bathroom, for a little small side table. Yeah, so every customer will get one of these in addition to their normal bouquet. It is now Friday morning, June 2nd, and we are going to be hitting a high of 92 degrees today. So spent the last 15 minutes or so watering. We are about to get a detached garage put up which will have plumbing so I can't wait for that to happen because right now I'm dragging a hose all the way out from the house to be able to water the stuff here. Now the things that are very water sensitive are the lilies that are being planted in crates. I've learned that snapdragon really benefit from consistent watering and of course the ranunculus to kind of just keep them cool. At this point I've kind of just given up on the ranunculus. I should have fertilized them more. I should have watered them a little bit more in the season. So now the shade cloth is actually going on the Lizzie Anthus to try to make sure that I get a good crop out of those. So no harvesting this morning. Um, even though there are some bells that are ready, I want them to be a little bit more open still for the market on Thursday. On, on Thursday, on Sunday, I did harvest some more Canterbury bells uh, yesterday for the CSA bouquets as well as for um, another local. Uh, grower who is making some arrangements. So today is just all about watering, delivering my CSA bouquets, and then tomorrow I'll get back to harvesting and putting bouquets together for the market on Sunday. Hey guys, it's now Saturday, the day before the market. It is time to harvest. It's a little bit later. It's almost 10 a.m., but as you can see, it's very cloudy and overcast. The storm, of course, skipped us last night, so we still didn't get any rain, but I am preparing my buckets and gonna go out to harvest the flowers for tomorrow's market. One thing I just wanted to add was I'm preparing my buckets and I always put holding solution in my buckets, especially this time of year for harvesting. So I know that people get really confused between holding solution, flower food, quick dip. They're all three different types of products, but the reason why I really like something like holding solution 
especially with something like a Flora Life Express 300. Now, this video is not being sponsored by them. I don't get anything for talking about this, but you only cut the stem once and it helps hydrate the stem and then you don't have to cut the stem again. So it makes it really easy when you are processing bouquets later on and not needing to cut the stems to hydrate or, you know, if not all of your stems are at the same length and you want to preserve a shorter stem you don't have to worry about that stem potentially not getting hydrated so the holding solution also makes sure that there's a certain level of acidity in the water to um to prevent too much bacteria from overpopulating so there is some benefit in that too and then of course it also encourages the the flowers to open up a little bit more studies show that it also helps with the vibrancy of the color so that's how it is a little bit like flower food but really it is to hydrate the flower and also keep the bacteria in check in the water so i always recommend using something like a holding solution if you're harvesting Two buckets are all filled, ready to go. I like to have them ready. I think I might need a third bucket, but I'm gonna go off harvest and let them condition for a couple of hours before I start arranging. One last look at the Campanula. This is exactly what I was hoping would happen. More of these flowers opening up, especially for a stem like this. It just makes it a lot easier to show at the market what these flowers are gonna look like. They're gonna look a lot more full. One interesting thing about Campanula is the fact that the flowers typically start flowering from the top and then they start fl opening on the bottom versus most other flowers like snapdragons. They obviously start flowering from the bottom and going to the top. So I just thought that was kind of funny with Campanula. But I have so many stems to work with. This is that like rich purple, almost blue color, which makes it even more unique in my book. bucket number one I counted around 53 stems of the campanula we've got some snaps in here the snaps are starting to get a little bit thrippy and the yellow ones tend to have the thrips as well as the potomac apple blossoms over here which is fine because those are actually two of my least favorite then I'm seeing them more in the light pinks but the darker colors luckily have not been getting thrips yet and those are the colors that I really really like especially the the coral uh, salmon -y orange snaps and then I have some fox gloves but I have something really weird going on with a very um with a single fox glove that I'll show you and I have no idea what's going on but it's really trippy check out this foxglove i i almost want to use it because it looks so cool but something something funky is happening i mean these petals are not opening the way that they should be might be a virus might be something so i'm just gonna keep this and i guess maybe i don't know should i keep the plant um because i'm letting most of the other ones over winter there's more down there um but yeah let me know in the comments if you know what's happening with this guy here it just it looks so cool though so i have a few more other things to harvest including yarrow which is coming in yay as well as some sweet william down there and i even have some nigella these popped overnight i had maybe about four flowers before so i'm gonna see if i can get some decent stems for these they're just they're a little bit hard right because they branch out so much so i'm gonna see what makes sense to cut i might use some of the mason jars but i really like them for the seed pod so i think i'm gonna try to save the majority of them unless of i need the flowers and i'll probably know when i start arranging just a friendly reminder for those who haven't grown or harvested yarrow. This is actually my first time growing these, but I've learned that they're very similar to zinnias in the sense that you have to do the wiggle test. So sometimes we get over eager, especially this time of year, to harvest uh, stuff that looks like they're blooming. So you see this? The head's still a little bit floppy, so I'm going to leave this one alone. But something like this is definitely ready. When you see me do the wiggle test, the top part is still pretty rigid and sturdy. So yarrow typically need to mature a lot more than most other flowers for us to harvest. And unfortunately, most of these I don't think are going to be ready for my market tomorrow, but they will be ready for my market on Wednesday. So I'm excited for that. 
And here's the second bucket dedicated for the vases. So I have been a little bit more deliberate in harvesting stems of the same length to make my life easier when I make the vases. And you can see there's some ranunculus in here too. It's been a couple of hours and now it's time to make the bouquets. Now, one of the things that I regretted not doing for the CSA bouquets a couple of days ago was processing the fillers and making sure they were ready to go. Instead, I was pulling them from the bucket and it made it very, very inefficient. So when I reflected back, one of the things that I should have done was clean the stems. So what I did just now was I took the bluporum and the rule of thumb from what I've learned is that you want to keep everything that is uh, above the one third mark uh, on and then everything below that one third mark. So two thirds of the stem clean. And that also helps prevent having leaves in the water that might dirty the water when the customer puts it into the vase because they're not going to know to take off those leaves. So you can see for the most part, uh, it's a very long bunch of bluplorum, but two thirds downwards is completely clean. And then this is, um, everything is on the one third and it also just makes it easier to grab. I'm gonna have these horizontal on the table versus in the bucket. So I'm gonna put this back over here. Now that brings me to the Orlea. So one of the really hard things with the Orlea was that this is obviously a very branching type of filler. And I should have cleaned this up, not only removing the leaves, but also cutting this to more manageable pieces. So I'm gonna be doing that right now. I'll put this on a time lapse and then show you in certain parts what I do to clean this up. This stem here is a really good example of how being deliberate can give you a few more stems. Now, by me not processing last time and trying to rush through making the CSA bouquets, I definitely used a lot more filler than I needed in those bouquets. So let me show you what I'm talking about. When you have a stem like this, what you first wanna do is you wanna look for the tallest point because that's gonna help you figure out where to cut first. Now, originally before I figured out this trick, I would have just cut right in the middle and that would have given me two stems, but I can get more than two pieces out of this. So I'm going to follow where the top part is at, at you know, for this branching uh, Orlea. It's over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow down to the node in which it connects to with the main stem and it's over here. So I'm actually going to clip this part over here and that gets me to one over here. So I have this part over here, gonna clean out the leaves. So totally usable for a long bouquet. Now that gets me to this over here. So now I can cut this part down and now I have another piece that I can use in a bouquet. Same here. If I follow the tallest stem over here, gets me to this piece, cut that. I mean, we're still talking about like 16 to 18 inches here worth a stem length. And then I have this over here, which I can either keep or again, following the tallest, snip it off. And now I have not only more stems to work with, but they're more manageable to work with. It's easier for me to do, um, or it's easier for me to place these in a bouquet versus having all of them kind of flail all over the place. So this is a step that I am now incorporating into my bouquet making process. I think the process of investing time into this step is going to be worth it for when I make bouquets because it's going to make it a lot quicker for me to make those bouquets. So look at this way more manageable. Even if I kept these in the bucket, I could just lift them out one by one. Another thing that I need to focus on doing is taking these and snipping them so that they are straight because then it does not get caught in the bucket or even as I'm trying to fuss around with the bouquet. So yeah, this just makes it so much easier for me to lift out of the bucket and work with the filler.
So I didn't get to record as much as I wanted to. It keeps on drizzling. It feels like it's gonna rain, but the forecast says it's not. And then I'm afraid the baby's gonna wake up. So let me show you the progress that I've made. I have 10 bouquets as well as 10, six jar arrangements. And I'm gonna sell all of them for $20 each. This is what they look like right now. So these are definitely more reminiscent of my CSA bouquets. I have a couple more over here, which honestly I like better. Just a few snaps with a couple of Canterbury bells, more snaps over here because there's less bells. And then this is what the jar arrangements look like. They're a little bit, it's like, it's kind of hard to see when they're all together, but it's just Sweet William bells, some Nigella, which I feel like really add to the arrangement. Foxglove, a little bit of ranunculus, uh, some blue pleurum, and yeah, so all I'm left with is some foxglove, which is kind of hard for me to figure out what to do because I don't have enough filler, but you know, we'll see. Maybe I'll even sell them straight bunches. Um, I am very wary of selling foxglove retail just because of how toxic it is. So I always tell people that if they have a curious pet or a very young child err on the side of caution. And that's why a lot of my arrangements don't have any fox gloves so that they have that option in case if they want to err on that side of caution. So one quick thing before we wrap this up, it's a lot of flowers to put together. Basically what I have is 16 bouquets. Uh, like 16 doesn't sound like a lot, but especially this time of year when it's still, you know, relatively early spring, I don't have a structure. It's a lot of flowers that you need to grow. And I just want to pl put a plug in for the power of overwintering. Obviously, I could not have done this without overwintering and also my local grower friend overwintering. But you know, I am able to grow more flowers this year than last year at the height. And that was all through overwintering. So even though 16 at the end of the day is not a ton, it's a lot for someone like me who's growing in a relatively small footprint and who doesn't have a structure. Hey guys, it's like 6.15 a.m. Bit of a rough morning with the baby. So now I am having my coffee and doing my least favorite task, which is this board, because it is always impossible for me to find the letters, no matter how much I try to organize it in this box, whenever I move the letters shake out. But despite all that, I do love this board. And I found this on Amazon. It's a company called Little, Little Hippo. So I always make sure that I have this ready for the farmer's market and also for any shop that I'm selling consignment at, which is a very clean, professional way of displaying your information. And it does come with the lettering kit. It has it in different letter sizes and all that good stuff. So for anyone who's looking for a, a lettering board, I would highly recommend this and I'll put it in the description where I got it on Amazon. It's time to load the truck. And one thing that I have found to really help in terms of transporting jars is these little grocery crates. So instead of using reusable grocery bags, we actually buy these. They are collapsible. So when they collapse, they look like this. There's a few brands out there that make this. I think Costco is actually selling this when Eric saw it. But basically you just lift it up and then you make the sides rigid and then it creates a box like that and it fits six mason jars perfectly that are about 32 ounces but yeah here's how all the flowers look i even got a chance to make two more bouquets this morning i ran out to see what was ready there were more snapdragons as well as some yarrow some more bells so i made a couple extra bouquets i think i have 13 bouquets total and six jars so we'll see how it goes this morning, I also decided I needed to put some more information cards, so I made this on Canva. I'm going to make the font a little bit bigger, but I'm going to put these in each of the bouquets and print out uh, 13 for all of the wrap bouquets. So it's 9.35 and we are all set up. The stand is looking really good.
are about an hour in. It's 11 a.m. We've sold about $100 worth, so two jars and the rest were bouquets. So not a Mother's Day type of crazy sellout, but it's very good traffic today. So looking forward to see what the next two hours bring. So it's 11.50. We've sold enough that I can now reduce it down to two buckets. Uh, four of the mason jars have gone and we have seven bouquets left. So I would say going pretty decently. We are back from the market. So let's talk numbers. Now today was Strawberry Fest, which is traditionally a very high traffic market day. And that was true today from even before the market started, I would say at 940, we had people coming in. The market is actually now only three hours. They reduced it by an hour because last year during the last hour between 1 and 2 p.m., there was really no one. And I would say at 1 p.m. today, we still had so many people that I didn't even realize it was close to 110 when I started thinking about tearing down. So despite all of that traffic, we had thousands upon thousands of people. It was a very slow and steady day. And I know I'm not the only person who experienced that because I talked to another fellow vendor who sells mushrooms and she said the same thing. So when I walked back to my car, the market manager was a little surprised to see me still having some flowers. So all that to say, I sold $260 worth of flowers. Now that is not that much better than Mother's Day where I sold $230 worth of flowers. The main difference, however, was this time I actually raised my prices. So last time for Mother's Day, only my jar arrangements were $20. My market bouquets that were wrapped were $15. I raised everything to a flat $20. And in some ways it made it easier for the customer because they, it, it no longer was a price thing that made them think, Hey, like maybe I should buy a market bouquet or a mason jar arrangement. I was left with only one mason jar arrangement. And then I was left with five bouquets. So a little bit disappointing, honestly, given the amount of traffic that we had. Um, and $260 is, you know, it's, it's nice to have that cash, but it's not a ton of money, especially once you start breaking down the costs. So let's go through the costs. Um, similar to last market video, the two pieces that I really want to focus on are labor and the cost of goods sold. So labor in this case is really my time at the market and the time that I spent making bouquets. So I'm going to say I spent a total of five hours, so about three hours and change getting to the market, spending time at the market, all that stuff, and then another hour and a half-ish processing the bouquets. That's actually being a little bit more um, generous. Uh, you know, I feel like you, you're always spending more time than you want uh, to prepare for these kind of markets. And then that brings me to cost of goods sold. So I usually put the time spent on growing things in that cost of goods sold. The only part about growing that goes into labor for me is the um, the harvesting piece, right? So I keep everything related to starting seed, watering, and growing the plant into the cost of goods sold category. And I'm putting that at $50. So that is actually comprised off of two figures or two categories. One is I did buy filler from a local grower friend. Now I use part of that filler for a, um, for my CSA customers. And I actually give, gave a little bit of the Orlea to another local friend who's making those arrangements. Those were for free that I gave to her. But I would say that roughly I used half for my CSA bouquets and half for my farmer's market. And the CSA customers definitely got a lot more filler than these bouquets did because I really only had seven bouquets for my CSA customers and I made uh, 12 bouquets for this market. So I'm putting that filler piece at around $20, which means that the rest of the flowers are at $30. That includes the amount of money that I spent to buy these plugs. Um, I had that same local, local grower friend who um, gave me the filler start those for seed for me and she is the one who nurture them so a lot of the labor costs related to 
growing from seed are incurred on her end. The only other labor cost on my end is then transplanting them into the field and then watering them, which really was zero time because I transplanted them in September. We at that point had gotten enough rainfall that I didn't need to water them and then they overwintered and I didn't water them uh, this time of year. So all that added together comes out to about $125 worth between the cost of goods sold and the labor piece. So there's some other line items here that you can see, but that ultimately gives me a total profit of $92 back to the business, right? So that means I'm paying myself $75 for the labor and then the business itself gets $92. If I'm not paying myself, then I'm looking at roughly $167 worth of profit. At the end of the day, at this stage in my flower farming business, I am okay with that and going to this market. Now, I did not sign up for a market. Um, I had planned to not do farmers markets at all. And the market manager basically called me last minute because she thinks that that market should have cut flowers. And the other vendor, I guess, uh, they weren't sure if they were gonna bring cut flowers. So basically she told me, hey, if you ever have excess flowers, just let me know and you're more than welcome to, to sell here, which is really, really nice. Um, the other thing I do wanna talk about, which I touched upon earlier, is just having blooms this time of year. So the other vendor ended up bringing cut flowers and they had sunflowers, but they're also, a relatively big grower, um, they focus on landscaping bedding plants, so they have greenhouses. So of course they can grow sunflowers. With me, I don't have a structure. So the ability to put together these bouquets um, and be able to sell at a market this time of year, I'm pretty proud of myself for doing that. And I kind of blew people's minds when they were talking to me about my flowers because I told them I don't grow under a structure. I'm a residential uh, farmer, meaning you know I farm on my residential property. We don't have any types of hoop houses or greenhouses and all this stuff was overwintered and they were blown away by that. So it was really cool to see those people getting encouraged to put some of the same plants that I was selling, like the Canterbury Bells, into their personal landscaping gardens because now they realize, oh, things can actually survive our winter. So that was really cool, the ability to talk to people about that. And then I even had some people approach me saying, hey, I heard about your flower subscription through a friend. I saw it on Facebook. Like, it's really great to get to meet you. So a lot of times me being at these farmer's markets, the ROI is not just from selling the flowers alone. It's getting to interact with people. It's getting to answer questions that people may have um, from seeing me in other places online. So I also find that to be really valuable. And of course, farmers markets are a great place to do market research to see what kinds of flowers people like. Uh, and people loved the Canterbury Bells. So next year I will be growing them in all different kinds of color. So I would say for someone who has never grown flowers, especially on this scale, uh, during spring, this is my first spring growing flowers. I'm pretty happy with how things ended up. I essentially bought about a thousand seedlings from my local grower friend last year in the summer. I spent close to $500 doing it. And at this point, I've more than made back all of that. And I would say that the majority of those seedlings have yet to bloom. I'm still waiting on feverfew, yarrow, and sea holly. I had some attrition in the sense that I bought lupin, um, I basically only have one lupin plant left, uh, the verbascum, even though I used it for some arrangements, I didn't end up using a ton of it. So even with that attrition, it was a really, really good investment. Uh, so I'm really happy I did that. I'm going to continue doing that next year. In fact, I'm going to move some of the yarrow into my landscaping since that is native and it should be deer resistant. So what this means is that I will probably be doing a couple more markets when I have excess flowers. So this will not be the last market video, but let me know in the comments below how your markets are going. If you're seeing a difference this year versus last year and how the season is going for you in general. And I'll see you in the next